Um, so my name is Leonard and today we're going to talk about Hanami and before that I'll just make a short disclaimer I'm by no means a Hanami expert because like the number of apps that I've managed to deploy is like one and also I don't know how long it will take for me to explain every, all the slides because I didn't have time to rehearse so bear with me if I get lost don't just don't start throwing things first off let's start some exercising how many of you are using rails like yeah and uh, how many of you have used like any other framework besides rails like grape sinatra whatever all right so same people okay great so hanami how many of you any, anyone heard hanami use hanami Three, four, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 all right, we'll get to that. So, uh, Hanami is a full-featured uh, REC compliant framework for Ruby. It was known as, uh, like when they started, it was named uh, Lotus, but they had to rename it to some legal issues with uh, Lotus nodes in the beginning of 2016. So now it's called Hanami. And it's developed mainly at the the uh, guy behind it is uh, Luca Guidi from Rome, Italy. Um, it's, the slides are there. Uh, it was open sourced in the beginning of 2014 and as of yesterday evening it has uh, like 2600 stars, around 80 uh, contributors, 13 issues and 5 pull requests opened, which I think is like for uh, framework that I, I believe is like gaining traction it's quite uh, like there are not too many issues and there are not um, yet there are a lot of contributors already currently they're at uh, version 0.7.2 and there's a plan to release 1.0 somewhere this year so uh, they want to get the they are still tweaking the API. They want to get it stable so that they can then, that we can start uh, working on real apps and deploy them to production. I think that the author, so Luca, is now uh, working at the company and is paid to work on the framework. So we can expect like some more uh, rapid development. So Hanami itself, it's it's just a, a glue gem that uh, provides some conventions for using the full framework and it uh, consists of a router, it has models, validations, it has controllers, views and assets and mailers, of course you cannot have a full featured framework without mailers and there are some utilities and helpers and if you just read through you'll say that it's just like Rails, right? But it's not. It has some key differences in the philosophy behind uh, the framework and one of them is the, that the batteries are included but removable, which means that many things are opt-in rather than opt-out. So if you want to use certain features like cookies, for example, or sessions or validations, you have to explicitly define that you want to use them, not unlike Rails where you have to uh, find the file where this is uh, loaded and remove it or whatever. Uh, their philosophy is do one thing and do it well and uh, this is why they have this strong separation of concerns and by this uh, I mean that for example the router is like a separate uh, concern, the views is a separate concern and there's uh, not much interaction between the two. Uh, in some other, like in Rails like you can find active support all around uh, the other gems and it's really hard to swap uh, some of the like active record for example to swap it with some other uh, persistence uh, gem there's almost no magic like there's a less a lot less magic than there is in rails where you start to wonder where does this come from and then try to move your way up and they have uh, a rule of like zero monkey patching so you're not allowed to monkey patch Ruby or ERB or whatever uh, to get the shit done you have to find a way to do it properly uh, they use a lot of uh, just plain old uh, object-oriented programming and they have strong tendency 
towards performance. Oh. So, <clears throat> uh, Hanami is built around clean uh, architecture principles, which means that it's testable, it's UI independent and database independent, and there are like four more things that these clean architecture principles uh, describe. It's optimized for speed, and they can be fast because they are lightweight and simple. The author of the gem, so Luca, he's really like a bit crazy about performance. He's one of the, from one of the issues on GitHub where they were talking about uh, auto loading, I think, and it's like, uh, why should you use rerun or guard? And it's like they counted the amount of dependency that the framework would get if they would use one over the other. So this is really like you can see that they have passion for performance. Uh, so as I said, because of the low gem dependency, they also have really small memory footprint. And there's a graph that I stole and it's barely visible, but it's like the amount of dependencies that each of the frameworks has and the amount of memory <coughs> that it takes to boot up a framework. And you can see at the end, it's like Lotus compared to Rails, it's quite a significant uh, difference there. Uh, they claim that it's 60% uh, less memory needed to run a Lotus app than a similar Rails app. Uh, they also did some benchmarks, and these are benchmarks for Sinatra Rails and Hanami, where they, like the action is that they just printed out a Hello World uh, world. And it's, you can see that Hanami is like almost five times faster doing it than Rails. And the template is they actually rendered a, a template file containing some string. And it's also, Hanami is like four times faster than Rails. And keep in mind that this, uh, like when using Rails, they removed active record, action mailer, all this stuff. So it's really like just the bare minimum needed to get the template rendering. And for non-believers, there's a link. Uh, the notes will be posted on uh, Rook XSE, so the website. And you can click on the link and uh, see the actual code that is used. And uh, uh, these benchmarks are actually kept up to date. So which, with each new version of Hanami, they update them. So moving on, uh, Hanami is uh, like a microservice oriented. So you have multiple apps within a single code base. Uh, uh, this is like the default, but they also have uh, another architecture that they call like application, where once your application grows to a point that you want to start extracting things, then you create a new application which can be deployed separately and so on. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, optional features are disabled by default, so you have to explicitly say like I want to use sessions, I want to use validation, so on. Uh, there's a lot of plain old Ruby objects uh, all around the uh, Hanami code base, which means that the, the things are like really easily, uh, easily testable in uh, isolation because you're just dealing with an object, not with a, like a composition of those objects. Uh, we'll see later on some examples. Uh, they prefer composition over inheritance, so instead of uh, uh, subclassing active record you just inherit from a Hanami entity and you get this functionality mixings and what this allows you is to have custom initialized strateg strategies for your classes which helps you uh, test them at least yeah. so uh, to some the things that I've just set up uh, Hanami is configurable testable it's a bit more explicit because there's a lot less magic going on, but this really pays off uh, on the long run when you have to maintain such an app or if you go to a different code, ba like a different project that you haven't worked on from the beginning. There are a few conventions, uh, more objects because it's more explicit, and as I said, no monkey patching. So for those who, of you who still aren't impressed, I've stolen another slide. And this is like a list of all the features that Hanami has from version 0 0.5. So now they're at 0 0.72, which means that the list, I'm sure, has grown. And you, like, if you take a moment, you'll see that there's like whatever you need is it's here already. And if it's not, it will be added shortly. 
And now let's dive in some code. Um, yeah. So setting up Hanami, you install the gem. Uh, it comes with the command line utility, uh, similar to Rails. And to start a new project, you just say like Hanami new, you put the application name there, like uh, bookshelf is the example that will be working, uh, that my examples are uh, from. And optionally, you can specify the database adapter or the testing framework. Uh, it supports mini tests by default, and uh, you can also use RSpec, which is my preferred framework. This is the default, this is the structure that you get once you create a new Hanami app, and you will notice the difference is from like Rails is that there's an apps folder with S, and uh, inside, there's another, another subfolder, which is web, which is a default application if you don't override it. And in, do I have a slide there? No, okay, yeah. So, and m most of the uh, like domain code lives in the lib uh, directory under bookshelf. There you have definitions for your models, et cetera, et cetera. And in the web, you have controllers and routes for that specific application. Later I will show an example where there are more apps and you'll see what difference does it make. So then you have, you can generate another application here. Um, so it's, it's a new application within the same code base. Uh, for example, you could create an admin application or API or whatever, which has its own uh, controllers and logic to how to present the views and so on. And this is how the apps folder looks like. So you have like admin, and then you have web, uh, and each of them has its own assets, controllers, uh, views, and so on. It also has uh, this command line utility. It has uh, generators for models, for mailers. Uh, you, you have the console. You can uh, output routes. You can migrate, and you can start the server as you would expect. And now the router. This is the code for like the minimum code you need to write to get the Hanami router running. And as you can see, you can ju you just require a single gem. You uh, uh, instantiate a new object. You map a slash to a proc, which returns a REC compatible response. And you can start the app. And this will, like, if you visit the two, uh, 2030, 300, port, you'll see welcome to Hanami router. So it's like really, really not a lot of uh, other dependencies needed to get things running. So the router is, uh, it was written uh, from scratch because when Luca uh, started to uh, write Hanami project, he discovered that he there was no uh, lightweight HTTP routers, and the one that uh, Rails uses, which is Journey, uh, has uh, had tight depend still has a, a tight dependency on active support. So he decided to just write a new router from scratch, and so it's REC spec compliant, which means that any REC. Uh, uh, like an object or class or application that responds to call can be used to um, can be mounted inside the uh, router routes. It supports get, post, put, patch, delete, trace, and options, uh, which are the HTTP verbs. And what's slightly different from Rails is that each application has its own set of routes. So where we, we had web has its own routes, and admin would have its own routes, API would have its own routes. And then there's a, a general routing system which lives in config environment where you mount these different applications similar to Rails engines. This is how uh, a route definition would look like. So you have, here we've mounted two different applications, the admin and the web, at different uh, endpoints. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that unlike in Rails where you could mount both of them at uh, root, for example. Uh, this doesn't work in Hanami. The first one declared would eat up all the routes from the second one. So you have to be like, you specify the most uh, hungry app uh, at the bottom, and the rest you namespace, I mean, you 
define routes uh, with some prefix, uh, prefixes, let's say. Uh, inside the routes, you can, you have, like this is the typical REST, uh, typical REST routes for books, so uh, the HTTP verb, the URL, and the, it mounts to a certain action, and the syntax there is a shortcut for not having to write like web, uh, controllers, uh, books, index. Uh, it's converted automatically. And you can compress this like in Rails. You just write resources, books, and you get like the same routes. Or uh, it also supports like accept and only, so you can exclude some of the routes from being auto-generated. Accessing the routes, uh, which I still ha find hard to do in Rails because I never remember like where exactly the routes live. Uh, here you have like web routes, and then you can call like path and give up the params, and you get the your uh, the strings back. And or inside the views or templates, the routes are uh, accessible, so you can just type like routes dot path books or routes URL books, or you can use the uh, the thing that we're used from Rails, we have like books underscore path or books underscore URL. Um, the routes, I find it's really uh, nice that they did so, is that they didn't flatten the routes uh, into the view layer like they did in Rails, where you have all the routes just available inside the view. Uh, you have to explicitly go through routes, which makes it a bit more uh, contained and you don't have to wonder like where it came from and I believe it's also for performance reasons to save some memory uh, but I'm not sure anyway uh, <coughs> so the Hanami controller is different from Rails controllers uh, because each action is uh, is its own class in Rails you have like each action is uh, its own method and here each action gets its own class uh, which outputs the REC uh, compatible response. The controller is in charge of uh, validating or whitelisting parameters uh, and yeah, here this is a index action from the controller. Um, yeah. uh, so, yeah, we'll, uh, being REC compliant, it means that it has to respond to call. Uh, we uh, go through book repository, fetch all the books, and assign it to the books variable. And this is also different than in Rails. You have to explicitly expose the variables that you want to have in the view, so you have to call the expose books. Uh, this is a show action. And here, what's different is that there's a custom, you have a mouse, yeah. So there's a custom uh, uh, initializer which allows you uh, to pass in the repository and this is useful if you want to test the thing. I don't think this code is really, uh, does a lot but it's like a proof of concept that here you can, uh, like you can stub out the repository and then just uh, call, like instantiate a new uh, object, pass in the repository uh, call the call method on that repository or that uh, action and uh, check the if the results are what you expected and here another benefit of you having classes as a method uh, as a controller actions is that there's no need to uh, to actually go uh, like make a request you can uh, initialize an object and just uh, call methods on it and check if they return the proper results. So it's uh, different than what we have in Rails. Uh, there's another controller where I wanted to show the params. So um, Lucas believe is that params should be validated inside the controllers because there are cases where validating these things on the model is uh, a bit of an overkill. Uh, for example, the example that they give is that uh, if you have a user that has a password, uh, then you have a validation that this password has to be present. But there, then the, there's a scenario where you have invitations which should also create the user, but that user will get the password later on when he decides to respond. 
to the invitation. So in theory, like the user can be persisted without the password, but uh, having this logic in the model side means that you have to do all the like uh, exception, like the, you have to check if the user is now coming from the invitation, then don't check the password. If it's not, then make, the pass make sure the password exists. Whereas if you do this on the controller, you can have, obviously we would have different controllers that would uh, take care of this and you would just solve this here and the model wouldn't care if the password should exist or not because it's uh, like irrelevant. Uh, so here you, you can see like the nesting, so you have a book and within the book you have a title, you can check the presence, you can check the size and all sorts of uh, things. And also the author. Uh, and here you can validate if the parents are valid and then act accordingly. Um, yeah, to read more about the thing that I said, like where the validation should happen, you, you can visit this link that will be also in the in the presentation and Luca is it's a blog post that he wrote about uh, why he believes this is the correct way move on another thing that I like over rails is like you can access the params like in rails with uh, in different access uh, but then like the last two examples are a bit different you can check the like you can get the book title and it returns Hanami if it's there but if you uh, ask for an unknown parameter, it just returns nil. So if you have like some complex nested parameters uh, in Rails, it would be quite, like the code would be quite ugly to do all the checking. If it's there, then uh, get a subset. Uh, so here I really like this uh, notation with dots. Clear so far? No? Uh, about, so Hanami model. Um, as I mentioned earlier, or maybe I forgot to mention, like each of the components of Hanami can act as an independent uh, libraries, and uh, also Hanami model is optional. Luca claimed that you can use Active Record if you want, but I don't think it's like I would go just with Hanami model to save uh, troubles probably. It has adapters for SQL, uh, for memory storage, or file system. Uh, storage and it also works with some non-relational databases like Mongo, Redis or there's even a fork where some people made uh, persistence to work with Elasticsearch. Um, the downside of this data, data mapper pattern is that you have to explicitly do the mapping and I have a slide with that. Um, yeah. Uh, so, it, Hanami model uses repository pattern, which is also different from Rails uh, active record. We have entities and repositories where entities are like the uh, just plain old Ruby objects and repositories take care of persistence. And there's also model validations that you can include and do it on the model as we do in Rails. This is uh, an example of uh, Hanami model. Uh, so we included the entity, we include the validations, and then we can define the attributes and uh, add validations if needed. Um, so the, the entities, are, as I said, they're plain old Ruby objects, they don't know nothing about persistence. Uh, there are two things that are also, yeah, if the entity has published that or updated that fields present, it will get updated automatically. And there's also dirty tracking, which uh, requires you to include uh, dirty tracking, and then you have the same behavior as in Rails. Um, about the associations, uh, they're not quite there yet. Uh, they just wrote that, like, we are in the cycle of improving models, so please stay tuned. Uh, so the uh, associations currently requires you to write quite some uh, like repetitive code that like it's a bit painful if you have a lot of uh, associations between your entities. Uh, this is a, an example of a repository, so the persistence layer and like uh, you define uh, class level methods uh, where you query the database to return the like a published rule. So the, the, what's used underneath, I think it, it uses SQL. 
So the syntax uh, is uh, like I think it's just plain SQL. Huh? Um, you can also use like uh, create, update, uh, all, or find, and what they um, what they want you to do is like not to mix in the queries in the entities or in the controllers. Uh, they're all all these methods are private, so you have to explicitly define. Uh, let me see if I wrote it down. Uh, intention revealing API. Yeah. Uh, so you have to name your methods properly and then just use them. Um, inside your controllers, not to call the repository methods in the controller directly. Uh, so repositories, uh, models don't have to know about the persistence, it's a separate concerns, and as I just said, all the queries are private to force you to, um, forces you uh, to write codes in such a way that the uh, persistence doesn't leak outside of the repository. This is the mapping that I also mentioned. So it's how you map the entity to a repository and define the fields that are available in the entity. So for example, here for books, you have, uh, you define like this is a book entity, the repository is a book repository, and these are the fields and the types. Uh, these are just Ruby uh, types here. And the same for uh, authors, if we would have them. And then the models and uh, repositories, it go, they go to Hanami View. This is an example uh, of Hanami View. And as you can see, it like, doesn't look anything like what we see in Rails. That's because views are just another object. And uh, their sole responsibility is to resolve the view paths and render the template. And in Hanami, views are actually like sort of a presenters in the rails or hanami has another layer which is which are templates which is what we know as views in rails uh, so in hanami views uh, you can they're used kind of as uh, decorators you have to you define all the things that you want to use in your templates um, and this again it's like it forces you to write uh, all sorts of methods because the templates they don't have access to uh, helpers like uh, format number or uh, any of these kind of things it forces you to put this code inside views which makes uh, your code more uh, intention revealing uh, templates don't have direct access to helpers and this was yeah I, I said that uh, to share common code uh, between views so for uh, like if you have something that all the views would share there's a view prepare uh, and also in the controllers there's a controller prepare where you can include uh, some modules to be loaded for all the controllers this is uh, a view also where i added uh, like the form i'm not sure I like it or not, but the form can actually be extracted out from the template and it's, uh, it's built in the view because this is everything is just pure Ruby helpers and in the view, no, and the view is gone. It was supposed to be here. So in the view you then just call like a uh, book form and it renders the form uh, for you. Uh, and there's always a but, yeah. So uh, Hanami is great, but there are a lot, lo a lot less gems that you can just shove in and have uh, like half of your project to work out of the box. And uh, like the biggest programming book, which is Stack Overflow, still lacks the, the chapters for Hanami. Uh, but I think like as more and more people start to use it, I think even also the Stack Overflow list will grow. I had some troubles using Pry in the controllers. <clears throat> uh, I believe it's a bug, but like when you are not really familiar, I tend to just uh, use uh, binding.pry and uh, play around to see what's available there. And for some reason, it just stops working. 
uh, they're aware of it, of it and I think they'll fix it, but you can use it elsewhere. Um, personally, I'm missing a log, I'm used to Rails' log file, where you have like all the uh, SQL queries that were made, uh, like uh, you can just speed things up. In Hanami, you just have like the requests on the servers that were made without the parameters, without uh, which views were rendered, anything like that. So this is what I would still uh, wish to have in Hanami. I had problems deploying it to Heroku because of a single file, but like I deleted the whole repository and redeployed and it worked. Um, for those of you who will be deploying on Heroku, you have to explicitly uh, set this uh, environment variable so that you can have the static assets served. Um, yeah, Hanami doesn't have uh, assets pre-compilation like we're used to in Rails in Sprockets because he, be uh, again, Luca believes that it's actually just solving a temporary problem that might be, that will be solved with HTTP2 uh, where uh, concatenate, like, um, yeah, concatenation of the files will no longer be needed uh, because the protocol itself will be, uh, like, it won't matter if you load one file or ten files. So, just another uh, note that I made. Uh, <clears throat> so, there are actually some people that are already, already using this in uh, production. Uh, I just, I was able to find this for. So Envato, the DNS, DNS simple, or I don't know how it's polite. This is where Lucas worked, and they're the last two. I would say that for, like, if you have a product that you really want to prototype quickly, I wouldn't go with Hanami because you cannot leverage the big pool of gems that are available for Rails, and you can really put a prototype together really fast. Whereas, like at later stages, after the project is a year or two or maybe uh, five years old, then I think like moving to an architecture like Hanami, a framework like Hanami would make sense. To recap, <coughs> uh, Hanami is extremely fast and lightweight. It uh, has these two different architectures, like a container or application architecture. It follows separation of concerns really strongly. There's uh, less magic. Uh, uh, there, you have to be more explicit at uh, times, but this pays off in the long run. Uh, yeah, you tend to write more glue code, but it's just glue code is nothing really complex. Uh, you have repository pattern for decoupling your business logic from the persistence, and views and controllers are also objects, which, which means that they are easily, easy, they're easier to test. Uh, you have all your favorite uh, templating languages like SAS, Haml, Slim, or you name it. Uh, yeah, there are, the, there are not so many gems as we're used to with Rails. Uh, the community is still young, but they are really friendly and uh, helpful. So uh, if you have a problem, you just uh, shout at the channel and they usually they have, they respond really in a friendly way and quick. Yeah. These are some of the resources that you don't have to read through. And that's it uh, for the presentation that I had. OK, so you said you have one app in production already. Um, it's a bookshelf app. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but for your next project, how likely you are to use this? Uh, as I said, like from the beginning, for sure not, because uh, I like to reinvent the, for user authentication, you can use device in Rails and you're uh, ready to go with just including the gem and you're off. Here you would probably have to fiddle around with Warden and write your own strategies and so on. So I believe for me, I would like after the project will be up and running and that I would see that I have this pain of uh, everything being thrown at uh, the same application, I would, what some others suggest is that you then move to a component-based Rails where you like extra, uh, you split up your application into separate gems which are still loaded like from, uh, from the same application and then maybe like the third stage would be to 
really to just use a different framework. But from the beginning, for sure, I wouldn't go with... And I would wait for version 1 to come out first. Yep? Mm. Um, do you know if you can mount um, Hanami apps into Rails, uh, like by route? So, yeah, the question is if uh, you can mount Hanami apps into Rails, like Rails engines. Uh, I believe you could. Because it's like REC, uh, it's REC, so it, it could work. That's one way to approach it. <laughs> That's, yeah, exactly. Although, like, it, it would be better the other way around, to have, uh, to have Hanami as a base app and then mount Rails engines inside if you have them already. Yeah. Can you do that? Yeah, They are both REC compatible, so I, it sounds like it should be possible. I haven't tried it, of course not. What was that weird DSL where you were generating the form? Ah, the form. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, that was forward. Ah, forward, yeah. The long one, no? Yeah. yeah. This one. Yeah. It's, uh, their, these are their form helpers that they have. And I, actually, I didn't know that uh, Rails uh, monkey patched the ERB so that the syntax is the one that we can use now, uh, where you can have like the uh, you wrap some ERB in a uh, in a method. I think this is like a monkey patch somehow. Uh, Luca said that this is like this is how it should be. So you have like it's similar. It's just looks really different. My first uh, impression was also like of fuck no, I'm not doing this because I, it doesn't seem like you can really customize or just shove in some uh, HTML code if you need it. But uh, from what I've uh, tried, it, does, it doesn't, like, when you start to use it, it's not as uh, limiting as one might think. But it's, yeah, these, these are there, so they have form helpers like Rails has, and this is how they look. Do they use assets pipeline or do you have something that they build or something? Uh, they don't use assets pipelines. Uh, no. Um, their idea is like, no, the HTTP2 is the way to go and we don't do any... Uh, I think there is, they just copy uh, assets from your assets folders, they copy to the public folder, I think. And what this also, I think it was mentioned that you can, in theory, you could use some uh, other uh, NPM tools to minimize them and shove them in the uh, public folder. So they're staying away from... Yeah, yeah, from. yeah. I, I think that they're also like, that they like the idea of... Um, oh, boy, what's the... Uh, sorry? Not Bauer, the Webpack. I think this is like, the, they think that this is the more, like maybe, and I also think, start, I'm starting to think that it's like, we really shouldn't try to solve everything in Ruby, uh, where we have better and faster tools for assets, uh, pre-compilation, uh, or, or this mimification, uh, Grant and Bauer and these kind of things, maybe we should really just integrate these tools inside our Ruby uh, world and they can coexist, yeah. Well, but that's because we did it first. <laughs> <laughs> we did it first, yeah. Right. So, uh, the, uh -huh, yeah, so where's my... Let's go for a beer now, thank you. <laughs> I was just about to ask if we have any lighting talks, but Otto already volunteered. So, is there anyone else? <coughs> Guess not. Certainly not. Jaz bom improviziral, ker nisem bil pripravljen za tok, um, pa pač se mi zdi, da je tole zanimiva zadeva. Uh, pa vam bom danes predstavil InfluxDB, uh, 
Допозна случайно Time Series бази, по часовне бази, какво е тега? Допоработки е тега. Окей, хубаво много. Той е данес и за нашнега слайка, пач и с фирме. Кир Пачнек да предлага, готови да пач нека нова база обстава, ки се рече Cockroach DB и пач прави възкови сме това продукция. Той е малко шаве. Я сме данес показвал Influx, па бъм показвал как проблем тренутно решуем, пач не сголе експериментално, па могоче бъде да я порабите за дело за какво своя продукция. Се прави пач, маш рецимо нек, Nek link na netu, recimo v tem primeru imam tukaj neko osebino na YouTube-u in pač tukaj v spodi je pač ena štivirka, ne? Se, to se zdaj imaš, ne? Se pravi, koliko je to predvajan oziroma koliko ljudi je pogledalo to oziroma koliko ljudi to šera kroz cel social network čez celo mrežo in pač recimo, da je zelo zanimivo vprašanje v realnem času spremljati, koliko ljudi šera neko vsebino. In to me je pač neko tako zanimivo vprašanje, jaz sem rekel pač, kako bi to najbolj elegantno rešil in da bi pač bilo zanimivo. In potem se razvijo en tool, ki je napisan v Go, reče samo Sokol, ki gre na različne social network in pač tam paralelno deluje poišče, koliko je bilo nekih playov, lajkov, šerov in podobno. Se pravi to zdaj konkretno ta video, pogledamo in vidimo recimo, da ima tukaj, vidimo recimo na Facebooku, ima recimo, ne vem, skor 50, oziroma, so 500 tisoč nekih lajkov. Se pravi, imamo neke številke, pa neke meta opisi, ampak nič specifičnega, ampak gremo za neke numerične vrednosti. In zdaj ta library je pač tudi na mojem githubu, lahko si ga pogledate, lahko ga starate, napisan je za Heroku pa za Docker, tako da, če imajo do kakje bolj podrobne želje, za kaj se gre, lahko pogledate. Ampak napisan je kot neki servis, ki ga pač kličeš in ti vrne nazaj neki JSON. Zdaj pa naslednje vprašanje je, kam lahko te številke shranjujemo, pa kaj se zgodi, če recimo naše metrike ali scheme se spremenijo, se pravi, če imamo zdaj neke lajke, pa če pa dodamo neko drugo platformo, ki ima najem pleje, pa da lahko pleje monitoriramo, kako lahko najbolj skelebo infrastrukturo naredimo, da bomo to pač zajeli, pa da ne bo treba recimo scheme spremenjati. Plus, da hočemo to spremljati v nekem realnem času. In ena izmed orodij, ki so najbolj premerni za to, je recimo Influx, oziroma Influx DB. To je v gojo napisana baza, ki je specializirana za čas. Njena posebnost je to, da dela na dveh frontah, eno je pač to v realnem času, druga je pa potem, da s pomočjo določenih retention policy lahko podatke hranimo za več, ko recimo 24 ur, kaj je neko defaultno okno. In zdaj, kaj imam tukaj en demo recimo, iz včera, ne vem, če ste spremljali nekaj medije, je bilo veliko faz v tem, da je pač enen Mariborčan na YouTube objavil neki video, kjer je pač nekaj gruzil in so ga potem odkrili in je bila to novica dneva. In pač se zdaj bom pokazal, kako se je ta novica trekala skoč čas oziroma kako so se ne vem, lajki navirali. To imam štiri URL-e, ki so na štirih različnih medijih in za vsakega od teh medijev noter opišem pač neki URL-e in pol pač neki ta moj sistem ga pač treka. Zdaj, kaj se dogaja s tem linkom, lahko vidimo recimo prikazano v realnem času v temu v grafani, ki je pač neki tool za prikazovanje podatkov iz časovnih baz. In tukaj recimo vidimo zdaj, če pogledam, recimo poviščemo, zato imamo ID, ki je to pač prototip, to je recimo UID članka iz 24 ur. Ja, krečemo, tega bom bom, se pravi, rečemo, da je rov, 
Това е граф. Помрекли да ме приказува вайб. Помрекли да е канала. Па да ме приказува рецимо. Лайки рецимо. А то видимо за задних 14 тур. За че това да ме приказува и най тривало 5 секунд, така по мене да бъл да се 5 секунд е освежувал, лахка би то, не вем, наредо с веб-соки, ти бъде пач константно мел, па по-лахка видимо, без това как та новица пач придобива неки лайки. In zdaj, če hočem spremljati, če ne vem, RTV, recimo, rečem, da me zanima še neki drugi ID, To zdaj vidim, to zdaj mogla biti zadnji štem vajstvo. Ok. To bo lajka, to ne ga min. A, min je, ja, pardon. Tukaj moramo dati select max. Select Ja, tu reši moram dati grupiraj po še na ID. To pa zdaj vidimo recimo kaj se dogaja z lajki na, se pravi to zgorna črta je 24 stvar spod na RTV. Zdaj če dam še enega recimo, ne vem, za fin, večer. To bomo dali or. Pa bi se to zdaj... Kaj sem? Evo ga, to vam zdaj se pravi vidite, da pač večino smeta ne poberete 24 tur, pa pa kaj RTV ostalo bo pač nekje niže dol. Zdaj pač to, te številke se pač nabirajo, zapisujejo se noter v Influx in pač po jih lahko pač na take query poizvedujemo. Zdaj Influx v osnovi prije še z enim takim toolom, to je out of the box Influx, to kaj sem pokazal je tool za vizualizacijo. Lahko rečem tukaj, pokaži mi baze, vidimo, da imam Snovi ima nekaj internal, pa še pač potrebi, pokaži mi ritve. Zdaj, ker pač uporabljam vzadi neki Rails app, obstaja neki plugin za Rails, kjer ti vsa je matrike iz Railsa, recimo koliko je query-o, koliko hitro se view reloadajo, koliko hitro se kontrole reloadajo, ti tudi te podatke pošilja na trevi Influx, tako da lahko recimo vizualiziram. Recimo, to zaprimo, se pravi. Zanima nas graf, zanima nas ta baza, zanima nas recimo baza, pa zanima nas neka vrednost. To pomeni število query, ta vrednost recimo skozi čas, pa lahko rečem še Zdaj sem za prvo, še drugo pokažem. Se pravi, kontrole recimo. In pa pač lahko to združuješ, pa pač daš kar ko. Zdaj, Influx je zanimiv zaradi tega, ker ima svoj neki strip down SQL, se pravi lahko neke SQL query pišeš, ki imajo neke specifike, še pač specialne stvari za čas. In to je basically it. Zdaj, Influx je pač kao full scalable zadeva, tako da lahko tudi postaviš, da se neke klasterje, če pa hočeš imeti neko ultra high availability, pa pač je enterprise vzadi, pa pač neko licenco kupiš. Zdaj, To bom pokazal še, še to je Influx stack, se pravi na tej strani, na strani zajemov, lahko imate, lahko direktno pošiljate Influx, kar jaz sem tukaj delal, 
lahko imaš pa recimo na sistemu, kjer nekaj je plofa nekega kolektorja, recimo stat zdaj ali pa telegraf in ti nabirajo lokalno na hostu statistiko, pa pol z nekim zamikom lahko pošiljajo v Influx, pa pač še nekaj filtrirajo. Statistiko lahko pobirate pač iz sistema, CPU, RAM in podobno, senzori, appi, baze, karkoli pač imate. Zadeva mora biti numerična, potem pa še dodaš lahko za vsak KPI, ki ga ostaviš noter še določene tege. V mojem primeru ste tam videli, ko sem izbral neke channel ID-je, to so pač neki moji ID-ji. Pol okolj Influxa je pa pač še ena zadeva, ki se reče kronograf, ki je zelo podobno tistemu tulo, ki sem bravo za vizualizacijo, pa kapacitato, kapacitor, ta je pa v bistvu za to, da si lahko narediš recimo neke alerte ali pa neke pametne algoritme, ki pač šlofajo na tej statistiki, ki jo pač imaš. Zdaj je ful scalable, zanimiva, predvajam, da si pogledate, če vas več zanima. To kot mene. Ja. Ja, mišljeno je, da pošiljaš noter neke numerične vrednosti z nekim timestampom. Ja, recimo bom pokazal na tem Influx DB Ruby, recimo, kaj noter pošiljaš je, da pišeš neke pointe, se pravi neke value, v tem primeru value nič, tege, pa timestampe, to se pošilja noter. Pač čist take, ne moraš noter nekaj blaznih stringov ali pa nekaj podobne. Ti biste delali snapshote? Ja, snapshot v času, cep, 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 skos. To je recimo še en primer, kak bi trekl neki server, pač neke serije za CPU, recimo na tem hostu, te regiji, pa še vrč neke vrednosti. Pa navadi neke numerične vrednosti, na kateri lahko pa neke same delaš, pa to. Ja, to je to, tako kot mene. Tukaj. Ja, jaz imam en kratek. Hvala. Jaz bom samo en tool vam pokazal, ker sem mislil, da ga vsi poznajo, sam ga očitno ne, pa verjetno upam, da ga vse pol od vas itak poznajo. Ja, se pravi... Aha. A to bo zdaj delal? Zdaj ima bolj, zdaj ima boljša resolucija. Ok, ima boljša. No, to je terminal. Se pravi, pač včasih, če rabiš komu pošerat, oziroma hočeš pokazati neki nekrel sep, ko ga lokalno lafaš, je uporaben tool na garok. Pač tako zgleda, kaj moraš napisati, vaš žaš port, jaz sem klaj port 5000. Zdaj pa noven se moraš nekaj saj napati, včasih se ni bilo treba, ampak Glavnem, ko se saj napaš, da biš nek token, pa poženeš en vkaz, da se ti to nekam shran v home in pol pač to dela in dobiš URL in pol ga pač šeraš nekomu in imaš pač tam app, ki prihaja v bistvu iz tega local hosta, pa ne rabeš porto odpirati, pa tako naprej. Tako da to je to. Kako da imaš uporabe, da pošli sam domen, imaš skozi isti sam domen. A ja, lahko je še. Aha. Ne, ne, ne. Pač... Minus, minus subdomain. A to? Še dve više. A tole, subdomain. Kosne in plače subdomain, pa ne, ne tega pa. V glavnem dejansko, dejansko pač pol dober dela, pa načeloma je zastojen, tako da je kar uporabno včasih. To je to.
Ази. Не съм разказвам това. Съдия си много. Не заповедат сам то да... Да се бъм захвалил спонзори. Слайда му кър се сам с текстом вал да не морам. Ще ми шкосна с губа. А, хер ми гаре. Да го тумарам, тук повя тя. Хвala Polygon na desmotle, hvala Toptalu za pjačo, če ne veste, tam gre ste po pjačo, hvala Uživo, da nas strima, hvala vsem, ki ste prišli, hvala Lenartu za Cool Talk, pa hvala Otu pa Jano za Lightning. Tle Polygon nabira za projektor, ker obviously, obviously rabi od nara, tako da ne ven vzetajte not. Tle so mi rekli, da moram reči, tako da če bi kdo kaj izperil, log da ste denar tle noter za boljši projektor, če že pjača za ston, log vsaj to tle. Daš pa ja, še enkrat hvala vsem, zdravje. Se vidimo drug mesec spet. To je to.